Jim is now going to tell us everything there is to know about RHEL 8. Okay, uh, the first thing that you need to know about RHEL 8 is officially it's canceled. Thank you all for coming. Hope you got some cake on the way in. Uh, so in all honesty, I, I wanted to have this done as a bit more... Jesus, is that too loud for you guys? No? Nope. Alright. Alright. Uh, I wanted to run this a bit more as an informal session, because you've all had a chance to play around with the beta by now. If you haven't, I would encourage you to do so. Um, I want to know what use cases you've had, what you've tried with it, what problems you've had with it, and I can tell you a bit about what we've run into on the CentOS side for some of the things we're looking at. But I kind of want to have this as a back and forth, so I want to hear from you. I know we've got some of the Facebook folks in the audience, we've got some folks from CERN, um, we have a couple of stragglers coming in a bit late. Um, I, I will warn everybody in the, uh, in the back of the room, there's a uh, plant from the Red Hat business folks, also known as the modularity lead, uh, Petter, who's here to keep me honest. If I say anything, he uh, threatens my career, so it, it's all good. Um, so let's, let's start. What, what questions do you have? What sorts of things are you interested in? What do you want to talk about? Are you looking at upgrade paths? Are you looking at the uh, base OS versus the app stream split? Are you interested in modularity? What, what pieces of the... Yeah, what would that be? Modularity. Uh, what specifically would you like to know about modularity? How it gets built? <laughs> Better step up. Come speak directly into the headset. I've got it. Oh, is there a hand mic? Excellent. Um, all right, so we can, once we get the hand mic set up, Petter, if you could introduce yourself, explain your responsibility, tell us a little bit about what you've got. You should not have come here. You will learn your lesson for this. And also, I'm Peter. Or Petter, depends on how you want to pronounce it. And I work, <coughs> work on the modularity team in Fedora. And for Apple, for Rel, of course, and so on. So uh, I've been uh, in the modularity team since the very beginning, and I've been responsible for the design of many of those things. So if you have someone to blame me, it's me. The basic goal for modularity was to solve one of the core problems within uh, Rel and CentOS that we hear kind of frequently. Initially, <coughs> when a brand new release happens, Everything is fine, it's all fresh, everybody's happy with the software, and about three years into it, somebody says, I want newer PHP, I want newer Python, I want newer whatever. Software Collections was a good stab at fixing that. Software Collections also caused a number of problems. Modularity is a different approach to that. Can you talk a little bit about why or how? So, modularity is basically software collections reversed completely. Instead of installing the binaries in, a, in a specific locations that define the software collection, that's a unit, we install them in just a kind of in the standard locations for the people are used to find them. For example, you go and look for your your software under slash off, you just find it under under user bin or whatever. So that means that you don't actually get parallel installability, but you get parallel availability and you can choose what you <coughs> who actually is on your system. Um, that's about the it, there is today, so if you have any questions. My question was, um, is MGS, do you plan, do you plan to support multiple installations in parallel? Because instead you can install Python 2 or Python 3, is it something that uh, it's a goal that will evolve in the future? Or the goal is just to be able to install uh, in parallel one version? So it's not the current goal, but we we are not saying that it will not be possible. So, so do you mean that, that would be just going back to the software mode? It's not our primary focus, so okay. let's put it that way. Okay, we had so does any package uh, ready on a modular dependency need to be modular also? We definitely start it that way, but it's no longer the case. <coughs> we have this concept of default modules that make certain streams of modules. Uh, let's take a step back. Uh, with modules, you have, you have a set of a content, a back set of content, that between which you can choose. You can, for example, choose this Perl 524, Perl 526, <coughs> streams. Within the stream, you actually get updates. Uh, 
so <coughs> I am torturing you with a selfie showing that I have proof I made you give my talk. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Now you completely distracted me, so I'm going to the question. Thank you for your attempt uh, already, and uh, yes, so there is no dependency uh, from the, uh, the new package to, to be a module. Uh, there is no need for the new package to be a module if it's ready on another one. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so when you actually have those streams, you, you can select one as a, as a distribution provider, you can select one of those as a default. Uh, so that means, in example, the, my example, the Perl 526 will be the default. So the packages from Perl 526 are available to all other packages, no matter whether they are or not. You can depend on that at the Perl 526. Of course, then when those users switch to 524, you might have some problems and you need to, to work with that. That means your applications may not may no longer work or if you are. If you are <coughs> I would follow up on that with a leading question. Does Apple count as a distribution in this case? Can Apple set a default module? It definitely can, but we expect Apple 8 to use the same defaults for all the module content that Apple 8 provides as well as it does. In addition to this, Apple 8 might provide additional modules with additional streams so that they have public freedom to choose what they want. Other questions? Uh, not, uh, this is not related to monodality though. Uh, what kind of ISOs are you guys actually thinking uh, about distributing? Because if you are just going to distribute this uh, really base OS, uh, all the installation scripts that they have for 7, 6, uh, they're just going to break. But, miserably. So, what is the plan for that? Is going are, are is some kind of uh, mixed ISO with uh, base OS plus extreme which is distributed or that's not the plan? So currently within CentOS right now, we haven't looked at that level of granularity for how we want to do things. But one of the things Red Hat has tried to do was keep compatibility because they know if they make it challenging for you to upgrade from one release to the next, it's easy for you to upgrade from the previous release to something else entirely. So compatibility is a bit of a goal for some variants of upgrade. You'll still have to have some default repositories enabled. You'll have to have, uh, I believe, BaseOS and AppStream are all enabled by default on the media. I don't see any reason that we would change that up. Um, as far as the repository structure, the one thing that we would have to look at in a different manner is what Red Hat is calling uh, the Code Ready Builder piece. Um, if you want to think, and, and you can correct me if I am wrong for this uh, gross generalization of it, it's an upscaled version of the optional repository that Red Hat had previously. Um, so a lot of the develop packages, a lot of the things that you would require to build against, <coughs> are put in that repository. Um, they are not designed for runtime dependencies or anything like that. So for CentOS to build, we will obviously have to have that repository. We'll have to make that repository available, but it may not be enabled by default. Does that answer your question for that? Yes. Okay. Um, if you are looking at the community build system, CBS that we run, that repository would be available there. It, it would be baked in with something that you wouldn't necessarily have to enable. Uh, we would have to do something with modularity around that as well in similar fashion to Apple and, and some of the other issues. So we'll have that structure in the build system set up, but as far as what the user sees when they install, it shouldn't be that drastically different apart from base OS, app stream, and that sort of stuff now. So what you're seeing on the beta should give us a rough blueprint for how we do things longer term. Yeah, so the question is, with Red Hat software collection, you could have the same collection on 6 and 7, and is there a plan for Red Hat to ship, for example, to Python 2.6 compatibility as an MBS for 8? Or <coughs> Python, because 2.7 will come, 2.7 uh, 
7 is the same as 7, and 2.6 is for EL6, right? right. So is there a plan to do something like that for, for customers? Thank you for answering no with a head shake. <laughs> I mean, you have to, I don't have any idea. Oh, okay. I have an idea. No, Hansa, are you allowed to say your idea? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other questions. What What else do we want to know about this? What, what other things have you seen? Okay, um, let's go with something slightly more controversial then. One of the things that we do know, if you've looked at the contents of the, um, the Code Ready Builder setup, or, or, I think I'm supposed to call it Builder now. It's Code Ready Builder or okay. Code Ready Linux Builder. I'm not using that. <laughs> that's, that's the marketing term. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> I should really control my opinions when I'm in public. Uh, okay, so what we do know, if you look at the contents of the Code Ready Builder repository and base OS and AppStream, um, there are things that are missing. There's source in there that just isn't available, and for most users, this should not be a problem. For the distribution itself, this could be. We're, we're not certain how we're going to be able to rebuild it yet just based on the beta. We'll find out a bit more when we see the actual code GA, but we're probably going to have to lean kind of heavily on what Fedora's got to pull in some of the dependencies and re-spin this. Um, Frankly, one of the reasons for Red Hat is a, a business support case, and that's essentially what it comes down to. Um, paying customers have a tendency to take packages that are entirely unsupported and lean on them and say, but I gave you money, you should support this. And so if those packages aren't available, customers can't lean on them for support. So the support burden for what they never intended to support in the first place goes down. Um, that seems to be kind of a fair position for me, but it does mean that there's some impact on the project side that we have to deal with and we've got to sort out. So we're not sure what that means yet, we're not sure how we're going to fix it, but these are things that we are looking at and aware of. Phil? Related but leading question? Yes. Uh, given you as an OS have to solve these problems to build the distro, uh, what would be your guess, and I don't mean specifically, I mean orders of magnitude on the delay between a RHEL 8 final release and a 7 8 final release? I would not even begin to hesitate to guess on that, largely because I'm not the one doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, I've transitioned into more of a management role. I am largely entirely hands off on the technical side, so I tend to rely on Fabian for that sort of thing. Except I also pull all of the other work on Fabian too, so he is suffering from the problem of. There are 18 different things on his backlog that are all priority one, so it's kind of a challenge. Um, the core team itself is reasonably small. We are looking for ways to expand that. We've got Tom from uh, CERN who steps in for some things. He helps to maintain the, the uh, uh, community build system package, but we can also lean on him for some other things, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Excellent. It was uh, <laughs> That's why I made him confirm. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're trying to bring in other members of the community so that we can have a bit more uh, share of the load because legitimately not everything has to be done by Fabian. He's just the one that has access and the keys to the kingdom across the board. So it, it tends to be how that happens. It, it's typical backlog work. Um, if we are able to share out some of that load, we've got some community members um, uh, Nancy Johansson, several other people, uh, Trevor, who put in a lot of work for our mirroring system. They help out with some other roles. If we can get them some additional responsibility and kind of free up resources, then they can help out for standing things up. But some of it is from CentOS uh, 2.1 through 7, it's all been an iterative process that's largely been the same. Take the RPM, rebuild the RPM, check to see if it matches, look at the, the sources, try to determine what the order is, and, and work through several things. It, it's been, it hasn't been easy, and there have been challenges in that, but it's been roughly the same thing every time. Now we've got this crazy kind of plan for modularity, which adds an entirely different layer of complexity and more things that we have to go through with to try to build. Um, if you saw for the relay beta, 
how much module content for building was actually in the relay beta source. The source for the packages was there. There wasn't any source for the module data or how that got built or anything like that. So in addition to figuring out what modules mean for uh, CentOS 8, we also have to sort out how to build them, what order they were built in, try to figure out the various components of that. And I can lean on Petter for some of that, but not a ton. That's, CentOS is not his day job, he's focused on actual product support, so I can ask him leading questions for, if I were doing this thing, how might that work? And he can give me an answer and then he can go back to his day job. Whether or not that answer actually answers my question is entirely irrelevant. <laughs> some of the non-modular packages in Roll 8 were built using modules. Which, <laughs> if, if you want to talk about layers of complexity, now we have to sort out modularity and then go back and build other things. And if, for some reason, there's a circular dependency, which has never happened in the entirety existence <laughs> of RPM, we might have to bootstrap some things and try and figure out what happens and then try to match that up with what we see on the, the uh, binary side and make sure that we're not wildly off base with what we're doing. So I don't want to speculate for what, to bring all of that back to your question, I'm not speculating for when we'll have it, I legitimately don't know. In fairness, I knew that was the answer, I was just giving you a good chance to rant. I appreciate it. Thank you. But also, we kill about five minutes. You're doing a backup job. Thank you. Just, just to complete the answer, that's true that we already uh, started by the loop. Of course, we don't want to wait uh, eight GA to our So then they said, hey, wake up. What's, what's that thing that just landed? So, um, for the base OS, that's, that's business as usual, like he said. Mm -hmm. but clearly, the big beast is MBS. Because that means that somehow we have also to find what well, MBS is the process that is used by the to build the modular. Um, but we tried to investigate if we could reuse that, and the answer is basically no way. It's meant to be reused in a specific environment, meaning that we basically have to find workaround. Um, some people from the community, a contributor to Fedora, decide to not even just to, do, to roll their own workaround process. Like uh, Remy is, in, is now Remy Kolek, uh, PHP maintainer, he's um, decided to write his own PHP script just to work around MBS because said it was not usable for him. So basically at the moment, everybody's trying to figure out if there is a way to fork MBS to work the way we want, or just reinvent it completely. So, so for, for those of you who don't necessarily know, the CentOS distribution itself is not built using Koji, um, because there are some limitations in that platform. Sometimes we have to cycle things through a number of times, which Koji just isn't a fan of. Um, however, modularity requires that we use MBS or some variant to do the MBS tasks. So what that means is instead of doing things the way that we have in the past, we either have to shift workload <coughs> to Koji and make Koji work to do what we want, or we have to rewrite MBS to do something equivalent. Either way, we have to sit down and, and write some code which we don't currently have. It. So there, there's a balance there. Technically, MBS is just an orchestrator around Koji. So if you are using a different system from Koji, you can just write a plugin. You can just write a plugin for MBS that actually builds your packages in Koji, whatever, whatever it is. We currently have one for Gopher, we have one for, for Mock, of course, for Logo Builds, and we have one yeah. for Koji. So. Except the one for Mock still needs Koji at the back. I know. Because I, I, saw, I saw that and said, hey, great, it, it can just trigger mock build, that's fine, I can have one for architecture and go to the Except that no, it's still target, hard coded, Koji path. So I said, oh no, that doesn't work for us. Because it still needs to tag in all the, the, the young company file that is using to inject with the mock environment is targeting and reusing the Koji existing repository. <coughs> so without Koji, that doesn't work. <coughs> So the comment was about uh, the mock plugin still relying on OG, and that is entirely true. I don't know, talk to us, maybe we can figure out a better solution for for Centos. But to address the elephant in the room, right? Like, you're basically describing rebuilding the infrastructure from scratch, effectively, which makes people pretty scared that, like, CentOS 8 is going to come out nine years after Rally comes out. <laughs> so nobody wants a replay of Cent 6. Um, We'll just call that one out live because it is what it is. We have a number of people on the team who are familiar with Koji. 
um, one of the coaching maintainers is on the CentOS board. This is not something that we are unfamiliar <coughs> with. It's just a challenge for the way that we need to get things done. Um, somebody has to sit down and write the code, and frankly, the CentOS guys were always traditionally ops to begin with. It, it, it's just how it is. Now that we are tied in a bit more closely with Fedora, we have a few more ideas for how to make this work. We can lean over and look at the Fedora Ansible scripts for setting everything up and look at the playbooks and say, okay, we can do something along this line. We can make this work, we can tweak it in this way. Um, we cannot share the build system with Fedora because we want to do things to the packages that would make the Fedora admin scream at us very loudly. Um, there are some protections in Koji to keep iterative builds in mind, and we basically need to take the safeties off so that we can do the same build multiple times. The Fedora folks don't necessarily like that, and frankly, it's the <coughs> distribution and the Fedora distribution are each iterative. Um, they don't expect you to need to roll back or redo a patch and then rebuild something else against the version, which we typically have, I, I can't say we typically have to do, but it's not unheard of that we have to do that work. So we, it's, this week, this week, week. yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's that sort of thing that we have to keep in mind that makes our build system kind of a snowflake case. It's not that we are reinventing things from scratch, it's that we have to sit back and say, okay, of the buffet of tools that we have at our disposal, what requires the least amount of work to hammer this thing into a shape that we want? So I had a follow-up question. Um, I know a lot of people are working on different uh, part of eight and looking at Remy, us, you. Mm -hmm. So should we start uh, some thread somewhere and try to get all these people together? Because we didn't do that on the mailing list yet, I think. Is it a good time now? Because uh, before Christmas it was a bit early because nobody had looked. But uh, will the community be interested in having a, a thread-oriented discussion about eight? I think we should. Um, Pat from the CentOS Founder, from, not from oh, Jesus, uh, that'll give me in trouble. Uh, Pat from Scientific Linux is already looking at some of this and has filed some tickets in Pagger for a couple of features and uh, has reached out to discussions for Fabian for, hey, have you guys looked at this thing? I do think it would be beneficial for us to collaborate as a group and see if we can actually share a build system and say, look, here's one unified thing. Everybody who's doing this is using this toolkit, if not the same install, at least the same tooling to do the builds, because that will keep us all more closely aligned so that we can share common repositories like that. Because if Scientific chooses to do one thing and they run off in a different way and something isn't equivalent and we do it a different way and CERN does it a third way, and we all try to install something from Apple, that's going to be a problem. So the closer we can get the tooling aligned among the community, the better. Also you. <laughs> Follow-up question, Apple, Apple 8. Can you say something? Or do you have plans for Apple 8? Or? We have plans for Apple 8. No, thank you, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so legitimately, last week at DevConf, um, we sat down, and, and by we I mean uh, uh, Patrick, Petter, and several developers were locked in a room and discussed at length until they finally pounded on the door and said, look, we, we came to an agreement, we're okay with this, please let us out. Um, and we figured out how Apple 8 should be built. Um, there's a little bit of work to do there, I think there's a, a there's a change from the Ursa Major tool to something else. You, you were uh, one of the people blocked in the room. Can you explain? <laughs> Actually, back to you, because back up. Uh, in essence, we would like to decompose Roll 8 as soon as published and then re import it into federal infrastructure. And then we organize a tagging structure for building content so that we, we pull from those tags that represent the modules. That requires some changes in Koji, it requires changes in MBS. And it's just an idea at this point. It was literally the last week. So, so we, we have a plan. Now it's up to us to go back and try and implement the plan to see whether or not that works. It's up to Patrick to implement the plan. You mean that's what I did last week? Yes. <laughs> I haven't seen you since. <laughs> um, so with, with the uh, team effort, we should have something for Apple available um, 
hopefully before it GA, so people can test it against the beta and see what goes on. But if not, then it'll come out. There is a plan for how to do it. We should be putting something public on the Fedora wiki about Apple, um, hopefully in the next week or two, to kind of describe what the plan is, what the level of it is, who's going to be involved in it, how it's all going to work. Um, we're starting to do this more on the, uh, the engineering team as a whole anyway, just to be more public and transparent about what we're doing, so that should all be documented out. Uh, but in the case of Apple, that'll be on the, the Fedora wiki since Apple is kind of a Fedora thing. Regarding um, April 8th, we will, um, if, assuming that not everything from the base distro is um, publicly available just to build a distro, that means that some package needed to build it are not published. Uh, we, I mean, we as building the distribution for centers are in that kind of problem. I guess that the same thing that happened for Apple 8. So we start the chicken and egg, who starts first? So Apple, and we wait Apple 8 to provide those packages that we can just build and consume, or do we start and then Apple would just, if, if that's not public, how can we do that? In, so, you were mentioning Linux builder before. And uh, to actually provide the version for Apple A, we will be decomposing, well, a base OS, right? That should run its ERP. That should provide at least a minimum set of dependencies to the standard of the But you can't take the builder or I don't know if you like you just put it up to push somewhere? So the, um, yes and no. The code ready builder is public, but it is not freely available. Um, you have to give Red Hat an email address and sign up for it. So there's a, a bit of a barrier there. For CentOS, we will get the sources. Um, what those sources look like for the source RPMs will be exactly the same as before. What it looks like for modules, we're still working with Red Hat to sort out. Um, as far as Apple, that has always been built against RHEL, so they just get to enable those packages and they, they obfuscate how those are delivered into Koji um, as an external repository. So the Apple Koji will have access to all of the uh, binaries that Red Hat has. If somebody wanted to build against something that isn't there, they have two options. They can either file a bug and say, hey, this doesn't exist, it needs to be put in here, or they can provide that package as a module and then build against that uh, so that it would not conflict with the package. It would be a module, they link against the module as a build dependency, and then they spin their own uh, module or package from that. It's pretty much correct, yes. But initially, yeah. initially we would like to only build non modular packages for Apple A and only the second round after we stop calling a beta, we start with Although, of course, we need to solve all of it in the first round. Pablo. Uh, during the 7.6 release, uh, the, some of the packages changed from living normally to living tools like niche ability or something like that that weren't publicly available. So even the guys from Scientific is doing bad. The journey had to reveal those tools from somewhere mainly Fedora, but they weren't using the same version that was being used in Red internally. Is there a plan to fix those kind of problems for 8 or for 7.7? That is a really good question. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. That frustrated me to no end, and as a Taking off the CentOS hat, and as a Red Hat employee, I yelled kind of loudly about that internally. Whether or not that yelling had any effect, I don't know. I, I cannot make promises about that. Um, at least in 7, if they did that for 7.6, and I, I, yeah. I shouldn't say if, because we know they did that, but I would expect that behavior to continue in the 7 tree. I would hope that in 8, they do that differently with either modularity or something that is equivalent, and that those sources are at least available, if not necessarily easy to rebuild. So, so just to, uh, 
understand correctly, so it was about missing technical that are necessary for building. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, it was a Rust thing, Golang changed, and there was something else. And Meson and Nichabil. Will mm -hmm. Questions? What, what else do you have? What else would you like to know about it? <laughs> Introductory pricing? Health discounts, <laughs> all of the things I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> uh, what about uh, the different arch which will be supported by CentOS? Is it uh, different from what will be supported by Red Hat? Because only was 64 uh, bits uh, arch will be supported for 80. But okay. we support. Um, if I386 could very politely go fall off the edge of the world somewhere or stop being a thing, I would really love it. I don't necessarily care that passionately about I386 build. I know that we need to, I know there's some compatibility stuff in there, I just really wish it would start going away. As far as the ARM hardware or other architectures, uh, we'll run it as we have in the past. If we've got the hardware for it, we will make the builds happen, and we should put effort into supporting some things that Red Hat necessarily does not. Uh, Arm HFP is a decent example of that, but because Red Hat doesn't necessarily put a lot of effort into testing something they have no intention of shipping, it might not release on the same schedule. We may have to worry about the primary architectures that are supported first, and then come back and look at the secondary architectures like Arm, uh, or other pieces of RAM. So when I say ARM, I mean ARM HFP, the 32-bit ARM, not ARM64. ARM64 supported on the box, that's uh, along with uh, PPC64 LE and S390, there's a couple of other ones, obviously. Um, I think S390 right now is the only one that we really don't support on the CentOS side, and we have uh, community members who are working on bootstrapping that and having that in place. So the, the primaries will be supported, everything else is best effort, but we want to get it as broad as we can. Yes? Uh, first of all, uh, the modules remind us that it's very hard to name things, uh, because it's a pretty bad name, because it's just from a lot of other things already, and then I'm wondering what will be the impact on the SIG, because as a SIG I might want to maybe promote a new module or a new version of certain stuff that might already be a module in, in Red Hat. With, uh, with the current software collection, it's easy because it's a different part you can install it and you cannot be confused about that. But as a user, if I install, let's say, my IDB 11, uh, how will I know if I install one from the SIG or one from Red Hat Upstream? Because we might decide uh, as a SIG that we need my IDB 11 and then in the next point really is that decides, oh yeah, we will also publish that as an upstream, so how will you deal with that? So there are a couple of things going on there. Um, the question is what happens if CentOS makes module, or a CentOS SIG makes modules that Rel also ships, uh, or ships later? Because we all know that Red Hat has never added a package at all in the lifespan of 7 as new technologies have come in, like say containerization. Um, the default modules will stay the default modules and we'll try to match that as much as we can. That does not stop you as a SIG from rolling your own module that conflicts with a uh, default module that supersedes a default module. You can pick and choose. That is kind of the idea behind it. Um, if Red Hat adds a different module later on, great, Red Hat adds a different module later on. My understanding is the defaults should stay the defaults. They may change things after that, but I believe the defaults are going to stay uh, consistent. What we could do is look at a naming convention because your problem gets a little more complex when you look at some of the things that the Fedora project has discussed doing with CentOS, which has been sharing modules. Fedora is already doing some of the modules. We may try to build some of the Fedora modules for CentOS, and Fedora may try to build some of the CentOS modules to run on Fedora. So as we look at this uh, basically 
three-legged table. We need to make sure that there's a naming convention in place or something to that effect so that we're not overwriting or, or conflicting with Fedora packages or we're not trying to do uh, the exact same thing. But this is something that should be solved with the idea for stream branching and how modularity works anyhow. We just have to agree what the flow is. Does that seem about that's, right to you? I don't know that's pretty much correct, even though I probably wouldn't invent a new specific uh, naming convention for streams in CentOS. We would definitely like to reuse the same names and build it automatically for Fedora and, mm -hmm. and CentOS and any other distributions and applications. So, so in, in the module, if you look on the Fedora spec, in the module MD format, there's a platform tag or something like that where you can say F28, F29. I would expect you to be able to say F28, F29, EL8 and build it against CentOS. And if it compiles and passes tests, well, great, go use it. If it doesn't, figure out why, file a bug, and you know we can work on it. You can also say just build against anything that the build system supports, and we encourage maintainers to do this. Can you repeat what you just said because I didn't hear anything? Uh, we also encourage maintainers to use. We encourage maintainers to use the syntax which tells the build system to build your module against anything that the build system knows about. So in this case, it would be three versions of Fedora and a book. Okay, uh, so I'm looking at my Relate beta machine, been testing for a while, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the NVR, the name version release component of this. This looks fairly insane. Let me call. Let, let me read it out loud. The package is called libvirt daemon driver qmu. 4.5.0.8-18 module plus EL8 plus a counter of four digits plus a commit hash. <laughs> Please explain. Can you start by repeating the question? <laughs> yeah. The question okay. was why the package names are so insane. And the reason is that we need to, we want to build the same services. <coughs> For multiple modules, for multiple platforms, and still for the same stream of a module, while it is an actually a different binary artifact. In Koji, we, we use NVRs to identify binary artifacts. So, what NVS needs to do is to generate a new name for each of those. Even though they are built from the same source, they are built against different filters. They would have the same NVR. In some cases, it might be just a different stream of a module for the very same platform. It might be two variants of a PHP module built for Fedora 29 with different, different build types. How do we differentiate them? Well, we generate a special string at the end of the NVR. That's one thing. Then the counter before, before, this, before the hash, that's actually there to guarantee uh, upgrade path for when we just rebuild the module without, without bumping all the respect files, which is, a, which is a neat feature. If you have a module with 100 components and you just want to do a full mass rebuild, you don't want to go and bump all the spec files. You just go and rebuild the module fully. Then you increment the counter, you generate new hashes, you get a new set of NVRs that are actually following the upgrade path. And the module prefix before that, that's just signifying that it's a module. And that EL8 or FC, FC, F30 and such, uh, that is there to actually identify the platform it was built for. This is useful mostly in well, not so much in I want to point out, so that commit ID at the end is not even a commit ID in the Git repository of the project. That's it's correct. As someone who goes back to his cellar and helps people out on IRC, when I have to troubleshoot a problem with someone else on IRC, it's, it's going to be fairly messy. I'm trying to imagine myself in future interacting with people on IRC. So the, the hash at the end is actually, this is check some of the building. It's not a... It has nothing to do with, with, with actually the sources that you are trying to build. It just trying to right. helps you distinguish the binary artifacts. This deserves a whole wiki page unto itself. Kind of, you can really point uh, to people. I agree with you. How does this? Like what it means? Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess that in answer to the future question I will add for Central, that means that we will never have any matching NVR with upstream because of that. The concern is that the, you will never get any matching NVRs in CentOS, and that's a lot of concern. Okay. That is not uh, to, to help alleviate.
concern. That does not impact compatibility. That is just the NVRs won't match. That's true. Thinking about doc, uh, will there be a doc on oh. when to extend the MBS, when to create a new one? What uh, a SIG uh, should be uh, MBS or standard packaging? Uh, how that would be decided by the What is the guideline to create a, a modular build or a standard packaging? <coughs> what? I don't know if you got my question. I'm not sure. Uh, for example, you ship Python as a modular system, right? Will we be shipping, uh, I don't know, uh, OpenStack version X as a, as a modular bit, or it will still be standard RPM? Okay, so the question is probably about policies, whether to ship content as modules or, or plain and yes. RPMs. I think that's completely up to the maintainers of the So let's, let's ask a different question. If I have installed something as an RPM and a module is available, or vice versa, which one takes precedence? Can I install a module on top of an RPM or upgrade from, from an RPM to a module, or can I upgrade from a module to an RPM? So if an enabled module that you are consuming provides the same name, RPM name, as, as any other package that is available outside of the module, the non-modular package is completely masked and So that means that you can actually consume older NVRs from, from modules, let's say you have GCC8 as a non-modular package and you file the GCC6 module. So you enable that one and you suddenly start consuming GCC6. That's, that's how it works. If you want to revert to non-modular packages only, you just disable the modules. Have we thoroughly confused everyone yet? Yeah. Yeah. Rich. For it's worth if you go and you poke in it, this all starts to make sense. See if it's like pokes you back. <laughs> yeah, Phil can definitely explain. Come on. <laughs> Not he was like. You saw how I gave him the microphone <laughs> just for sitting in the audience, right? Yep. We've got another one. I'm not afraid to do it again. <laughs> How will modules affect the life cycle? Because now we know that uh, most of the breaking changes will be between minor releases, but uh, with modules, do you expect Red Hat to do like a half uh, release for streams and that kind of thing so that they might add a new feature or break more stuff between the minor releases? So one of the slides in the talk from this morning that you may have seen during the lovely blue screen session uh, was the fact that the idea behind this was slowing down the base operating system itself and moving most of the breakage to the modules so that they are, or the app stream, uh, to, to be a little more correct about that, so that the change for minor releases is significantly less. The, the minor release thing shouldn't be a big deal. That should just continue to roll and iterate normally. Where I would expect to see the changes in the app stream and the module lifecycle, and those get defined per module. So you can look at something and say, okay, this is a default module, this is going to live for X number of years, and this is an Ansible module, and I expect it to live for three months and then a new version, or six months and a new version. Um, so this is to give the application developers and the layered products, layered projects, time to adapt and set their own life cycles. Um, this has a follow-on thing for Apple, because if, uh, how many of you in here were running Apple around the CentOS 6 time frame? CentOS 5, CentOS 6? Okay, during that time, how many people were using Puppet? Who remembers the pain of the uh, Puppet 2.6 to Puppet 2.7 jump? Uh, yep, and all of the mailing list fighting around that because it was a breaking version change. Apple didn't want to make that leap. Modularity actually allows for that leap to happen because now you can say, okay, I am ready to make this change. I can follow the default and I can stay here and I'm pinned to this old version. It's already explained older MVRs can take precedence. But if I want to make the leap to the new version, I can. So Apple can have both without <coughs> conflicting with each other. So this, this is one area where modularity actually does help and you can separate the life cycle. This means that Apple should have shorter life cycles for applications, and they may try to pin that around minor release time or set it at 
a yearly interval or something. It's kind of up to the developer and what Apple sets policy around. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Pablo, how many questions do you think you get? <laughs> okay. All right, last question of the day. Pablo, yeah. yes. Okay, about spec files. Uh -huh. Win modules, different versions. Now, speak, speak directly into the microphone. Okay. This question is, is about exactly what you said, spec files. The idea is that Apple should have one spec file for every version, for every module. Just for every version. And the same spec file is going to be different for Apple 7, for Apple 8. How is that going to work? What's the idea? It's breaking in. I, I would not expect modules for Apple 7 at all. Just mm. no, I don't. Think that. yeah, that's exactly. For modules for 7, for that I know. Just enough that they never understand. But but what I mean is, it's going to be Apple 8. But you, uh, with the example of Puppet, Puppet 26 and 27. If they want to build both versions, they're going to need two different branches for one of, for each model? That's correct, yes. Yes, there, there will be different branches per module in Git, and we'll have to sort out how to build each of them, and then which one is the default, which one layers where. Uh, for Apple, that should be easier than for SAC. For SAC, we'll have to sort this out. Um, but the, the different branches will absolutely be a thing that you have. How that gets tagged is I suppose I understood it's not that um, those would be different branches because Enterprise Linux 8 would be its own branches from an existing module for Fedora, but instead for upstream that would be a different project completely for Fedora 6 or Fedora 7, which would have an Apple 8, uh, Apple 8 branch. Because you can't have a branch for branch. Right? I, I will let Mr. Modularity uh, answer that one. <laughs> You are asking about the differences between Apple and CentOS branches in In Fedora this bit, the, the differences between CentOS and Apple branches. So the Apple content should be built from the stream branches that follow the Fedora scheme and CentOS as I heard should be using a different naming scheme for the branches in the same disk. But I don't have any details. Mm -hmm. That should be the meeting on the 11th. Okay. I'll make sure you're invited. Thank you. So we are all out of time. Thank you. Please uh, consider bringing further questions to the mailing list so everyone else that wasn't here can benefit as well. And thanks for coming.